was leading the third box on a beautiful uh, Italian morning at about midday, I think it was. And I looked up and I saw the first and the second boxes ahead of me. I was leading the third box. And, you know, the normal procedure, you wait for the uh, jetties to let you have it with the ACAC. And they just waited until you got on the bomb, on the bomb run. You had to keep turning or moving every seven seconds, otherwise they'd pick you up with a Wardberg device that they had there. So we used to keep pretty steady, and that's what they waited for. You see, as soon as you got steady, they would let you have it with the ACAC. So we waiting for the ACAC there that day, and the next thing I looked up and I saw the first Swastik air that I'd ever seen in my life. Well, on an airplane, anyhow. And it was a Fokker Wolf that had sprayed us with the ammo but he was a bit too high, and but he only hit the top of the aircraft and chipped some of the perspex, which hit me in the face, in the top lip. And of course, it, you know, your lip breathes rather profusely then. And I had a yellow May West on, and of course, the front of the May West was full of blood. But I didn't, you know, take notice of it at that stage, because then the rest of the German crew came on. Uh, with the ME109s, there was uh, nine ME109s in this one Fokker Wolf. And of course the, the observer said to me, what must I do? Must I drop the bombs or what are we going to do? I said, no, drop the bombs as we, you know, we, 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 we must carry on. and we, we mustn't deviate because this is what they want. They want to break us up, yeah. So he dropped the bombs and we hit the target. There was no problem there, but they shot the number two and the number three I don't know what happened to them, but they either panicked or whatever, they went all over the place. And I thought to myself, well, there's only one thing. Then they were really giving us a full go here from the back. I said this to make for the coast. So I had this big armpulated seat. I pulled my legs up towards my chest and I pushed the throttles forward with my right foot. Full bore, both 2000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines. And I put the nose down and we head for the coast. And of course, the Germans, or there were a couple of Italians as well, I think, they thought, now this is a wonderful kill for us. And of course, they came and they gave us, well, it was, it was I can still remember it, that it was yesterday. You couldn't believe it, the amount of bloody lead they pumped through us there. And then I said to, afterwards to the rear gunner, the, the, the art team was still working there, I said, Dusty, for the love of Pete, man, do something, you know, it's getting heavier. He said, no, don't worry. He said, I can almost see the colour of this bloke's eyes here. He said, he's right in my sight. And, and the next thing I felt the aircraft judder, you know. And our Dusty said to me, well, he's had it, he's a goner. And of course, uh, I just heard all this from the back and uh, we were hoping for the best and as I say, the bullets were flying right, left and centre, but we were hell bent on the coast. So off we went and eventually we, we broke uh, over the coast just north of a little place called Servia. And well, I never thought about anything, you know, actually later when I thought about it, I would have to decide now whether we're going to look for a landing ground or we're going to land on the beach or, or just bail out into the sea. But that never entered my mind, strangely enough, and we turned towards the, the, the coastline there and I saw a little shrine that the, you know, the Catholics in, in Italy used to build these little shines with the Virgin Mary and holding the baby there. I saw that there and I said to the second pilot, I said, I wonder what's working here. And we didn't know whether the flaps would come out, we didn't know whether the wheels would come out, but the engines were still going and uh, we didn't know how much fuel we had left. And then out of the blue, just north of that little shrine, we, we saw this fighter strip. It was heavily camouflaged. Uh, 239 RAF were there. And this we found out afterwards. So this was an answer to a maiden's prayer there. So we turned around, but it's so short. How on earth are we going to land a B-26? You know, which took double the length of a fighter at time, at least. So I said to the second guy, I said, well, as we go past that shrine, we get close to the end of the runway. I said, we throttle back, this thing's going to, it drops like a stone, the marauder. And we hit the edge of the runway, I remember that, at about 150 miles an hour. And after that, 
I don't know what happened. We got to the end of the runway with the help of the good Lord, that's all. And we did a cartwheel and of course the ambulance was there and, and the OC of 239 wing, a RAF chap. And we were lauded as heroes and some of them wanted to go and look for the Germans that were left there. They, a couple of the spits and, and, and the, uh, uh, they had kitty hawks there as well. They took off but of course the Jerry's had gone home by then. And uh, now we get off the aircraft. I was okay. The second dicky wasn't too bad. I had this cut lip, which they thought I'd got the bullet in the chest, but of course, thank goodness it wasn't that. And the observer was okay. The mid upper gunner, uh, 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 Alan Alcock, he was okay. But the, the wireless operator was lying. He was going to take photographs of the target. Obviously, that was his job. But he was also using, there, was, there were two guns there, and he must have been using this gun. And one of the German aircraft uh, bullets hit the breech block right into his face, into his mouth. So when we got to the side of the aircraft, there he was lying, not saying a word. He was a Lieutenant Smith with this breech block sticking out of his mouth. Oh. But he, as I say, he wasn't bleeding too badly. So, of course, the medics quickly took him off and put him on a stretcher and took him away. And they got uh, Dusty Manier out of the turret. He was asphyxiated with the 100 octane that he, uh, he'd inhaled. And, of course, off we went to the mess. And uh, I'm sure we must have had a few drinks. And uh, now we've got to look for a place to sleep. So they said to me, you know, we had a... a South African shot down here a couple of weeks ago. He was his name was Roy Sleep. I said yes, I remember him uh, from Littleton days. He said, "Well, there's his bed there." As I say, he never came back about a week ago. You can sleep in his bed. I said, "Thank you very much." That was one thing in the squadron. You try to sleep in the same bed that you got issued with. So I said, "No, I think I slept on the floor that night. I wouldn't sleep in that bed." <laughs> you never know. So, of course, the next day, uh, they gave us a uh, Gary there. Or they sent a Gary from, uh, from 12 Squadron, and we got in the truck, and we went back to the squadron. And the next thing, everything was okay. I had actually uh, uh, gone to Naples, actually, to, to help ferry a new aircraft back. And when we got back, the OC and uh, all the VIPs were waiting at the aerodrome. And we thought, oh, hell, what have we done now? You know, we did have a little bit of low flying coming back. And we thought we were up for the high jump here now, but it wasn't. Uh, it's the RAF command uh, had uh, awarded the immediate award of the DFC for me. Well, for which I was very proud. But we had to carry on with the job and of course back to the squadron, had a nice party. I had to entertain the OC of wing there. I remember Jack Mossop, I remember him getting so full of blue and vino or whatever he drank there. And uh, uh, the chaps buttoned his tunic, uh, he was so tight, they buttoned his tunic back to front and called the driver and put him in the truck into the, uh, what you call it, the staff car like that and took him back to the wing. I never ever found out <laughs> what happened the next morning when Jack was about to get out of his uniform. But um, so everything, you know, had, had, had gone reasonably well. And of course, we were waiting to go back home. But as I say, eventually, you know, I did 72 raids there. You had to do uh, between 67 and 72. And I was one of, oh, could be the lucky ones, because I did 72 raids. And then uh, the OCs called me up one day and he said, well, you can go back to the Union, which I did. 